You're looking at a painting of Joe Papp. Uh, Joseph Papp founded uh, the New York Shakespeare Festival in the late 50s, and he uh, is painted here by Paul Davis, uh, who did posters for his productions starting in the late 60s. Uh, he started the New York Shakespeare Festival by showing Shakespeare plays on a flatbed truck that he took around uh, to various boroughs in New York. And later in the early 60s, the city gave him the Delacorte Theater to turn into a home for free Shakespeare in the park, which has existed ever since. And this summer, as a matter of fact, was the first summer in its history where they could not have the outdoor theater. In the late 60s, he saved the old Astor Library around the corner from Cooper Union from uh, destruction and uh, wanted to turn it into a home for theater productions, and he called it the Public Theater. It was actually called the Joseph Papp Public Theater, but people were still referred to it as the New York Shakespeare Festival. Paul Davis uh, worked on most of the posters for the Public Theater productions for nearly 19 years. Um, initially, uh, Joe Papp had made independent productions like Hair and, and said it was the New York Shakespeare Festival Public Theater uh, poster, but it wasn't done by Paul Davis. And then he hired Paul to do all the, all the posters for uh, the uh, show since. And he, Paul did them for 19 years until Joseph Papp died. He told me years ago that the beginnings of the, uh, of the poster art were spectacular. And then later, the, the stars of the shows had more and more control and the posters became more banal, as often happens with theater work. At the time, I was asked to design the, uh, the public theater work. Uh, Paul was long gone and I was just a brand new partner of Pentagram. And this was probably for me the most significant commission that I would have because it would be highly visible in New York City. My London partners always seem to be very visible in London and their identities for places like the V&A or, or uh, the pharmaceutical company Boots greeted you the minute you got to London. And I wanted to do something that was going to have that kind of visibility. I was hired by George Wolfe. George Wolfe had um, become director of the theater two years after Paul Davis died. And not Paul, not Paul Davis, I'm sorry, Joe Papp, Paul Davis is certainly alive. And, and he wanted to do what he called cleansing the palate to make the theater feel new again, because it had gone downhill after Joe Papp's death for two years. So he wanted to get away from illustration and do something that would be different. And we settled on it being typographic. At that particular in time, and even today, this is what theater advertising looked like. They were sort of banal headlines and funny illustrations or photographs and sort of goofy logos. Um, and if you look at mainstream Broadway theater, you'll find it's pretty much like that now. What inspired me was theater advertising from the uh, 18th century, the way I saw it when I went to London. And in looking through a Rob Roy Kelly book, I came over these um, terrific uh, R constructions for different fonts, realizing that I could represent the broad public by being able to create different weights that would make the name of the theater. And uh, here is my original sketch for it and the way I saw the plays lining up. And I created this construction uh, with my assistant from typography I had taken from CBS Records that was American Woodtype. This was from Morgan Library. And for a period of about uh, 15 years, I'd been photostatting it and cutting it up and also using it from Xerox machines. We put this together by hand because none of these things were digitized in 1993, which is when I began working with this. Here were the actual newspaper ads all done by hand, except for the secondary type, but they were real paste ups and mechanicals. And then we began to create tons of promotions and they were recognized almost in immediately by uh, people who had populated the public theater because they looked so different. 
I hired uh, an art person who was a, a, a typographer to go down and work at the public and he began doing handbills and things that we could print out easily on Xerox machines and distribute. And this went on for the first couple of years that I was working for the theater. The work became very visible because there was this wonderful thing called phone kiosks that existed in those days. For those of you under 20 and, and not native New Yorkers, these existed on every single corner in New York City. So if you put an ad on it, people went by it and they saw it right away. The, the phone kiosking and subway posters were done with a wood type every season and they represented two plays. And this still goes on to this day. But the individual plays in the theater did not get that kind of advertising space. They were actually out on the street only once. These, these posters that I designed were designed to be sniped originally and to exist and live on barricades in New York City, which was actually illegal. And they never had enough money to really accomplish this nor purchase a lot of advertising. So the reality is that these posters that many of you know and have seen reproduced were really not seen by very many people. They were seen by people who went to the public theater and they were seen by graphic designers because they got into shows and were in annuals. The reality was that most people who knew about theater were not aware of a change in identity from the public theater. They mostly re remembered uh, for a very long time Paul Davis's posters which were seen much more broadly and advertised much more vi vigorously. They existed on uh, spaces all in the theater district for years. These individual plays were uh, done like anything is traditionally done. I would meet with George Wolf, we'd find out what the content of the play was and we would try to demonstrate it using the theater graphics. Some of these things you saw because they were in annuals, the ones you never saw never got into shows. Some of them were printed, like the uh, Huey Long poster. Venus never, I think we printed three copies of Venus. The things the public did see were these full page New York Times ads for Shakespeare in the Park. And this became part of the problem for the public theater's identity because these were the, the New York Shakespeare Festival, which everybody already knew, and they didn't necessarily associate it with the public theater, which they didn't really know. So for a long period of time, the Shakespeare Festival was more visible than the public. We put banners in front of the public in 1994, and we filled the lobby with the work, and most people who saw the public theater graphics in person saw them here. Then in 1995, a show opened at the public theater called Bring in the Noise, Bring in the Funk, and this poster that I'm sure all of you know was for the whole season and the other plays were all listed for it, not just specifically the play. It was also painted in another form for a period of time on the side of the building. The play went to Broadway and became a monster hit. And this one did get sniped on the street. And then we made a series of other posters that appeared in the subway. And then there was swag and, and uh, there were CDs and there was a brochure that had this type that became associated with the public theater and also very much associated with this musical. And within these things together, people began to recognize the public theater. Then it went to Broadway. And if you'll notice, there's no public theater logo on it because it was a part of a production deal with the theater that showed it. So the ambassador theater is lit, listed with the public theater listed above as typography. So people were not necessarily learning about the public from the fact that this was a very successful mu mu uh, musical. And then um, Sabian Glover, the star, became neutralized and the um, type began to change uh, dra uh, gradually because this thing began to be copied, which was very bizarre. And little by little, we started changing it over a period of time because this is really what was going on. People were using it as theater advertisements. Other theaters picked it up and made things that looked like it. So to a degree, the public theater, which had never really established an identity, 
really lost its identity in the New York Times. And then, of course, Chicago uh, opened as a musical, and some of the type was similar, and they had a much bigger budget, so they wiped the public theater away. At that point in time, the thing seemed so knocked off and had become a style that I felt that I just had to change it. So I began changing the font every year. And I um, remember showing these posters to George Wolfe, and at that period in time, I was turning 50. And he said, oh my God, Paul is turning 50, let's have a year of depressing posters. And we did. Then I, I got undepressed, I think, the next year and began using different typography, but used a lot more straight photography instead of the style I was using that was more flat graphic before. And then bit by bit, I would change them year by year. Uh, I would pick a font for the year and then we'd hold to it. And the posters would look somewhat similar and then we'd move on to something else. And sometimes we did things that were completely off brand. Now, during this period, George Wolfe, after the success of Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk, had two flops. One of them was On the Town that, that went to Broadway after opening in Central Park and lost money. But worse than that was one called Wild Party, which was produced purely for Broadway, went to Broadway, was nominated from a for a Tony, had to stay open for three months when it was losing money, and he began to lose the endowment of the theater. At that point in time, they put a, a director uh, and a budget director in under George Wolfe, and she created lots of controversy and a lot of fighting, which period she said to me that she was canceling posters, we wouldn't make them anymore, and she wouldn't need me again. And George was still there, and he hadn't fired me, she had. So I wasn't doing anything for the public that one season. Then George resigned and Oscar Eustace became the director of the public theater. And George had, at the point that he, he had resigned, um, a uh, financial manager that he liked. And the public theater hired me back and put me on the board because they had no more money to pay me. So they were honoring me by making me go to board and director's meetings, which I found long and boring and didn't want to be at. Oscar decided to make a 50th year anniversary identity for the public theater. And I revisited the identity by going back and redrawing the logo in Accidents Grotesque, thinking why not pick something neutral and make the style the way that we managed it, the look of the theater. We did this for two, two seasons or three. And during this period, um, the financial manager who worked with Oscar, uh, who he had inherited uh, from George, both she and Oscar had totally different opinions about what things should look like. So the following year, after fairly much success with this campaign, we began to really change it, but every year became sort of a little bit of a controversy. And in the final year, these are the amount of posters I made for one show, which had never been the case before because you had two people with two different uh, opinions about what things should look like. And this is what the final poster came out like, and I think it's one of the weakest posters. At which point, the clash between them was strong enough that the, the uh, financial manager resigned and, and Oscar became the main director of the theater. That year, I had done uh, this free love poster, which um, was much easier to accomplish because I had a nice rapport with Oscar, but I felt that he had inherited me and, and he would never feel completely comfortable. In fact, shortly after I produced this poster, he called me up and he invited me to have lunch with him and I was positive he was gonna fire me. Uh, I went to the lunch and he told me that his favorite work was when I had first done the public theater and could I go back and readdress the whole thing for him. So I did, at which point I changed the type to knockout, which was the, the font that Hepler had designed um, off of the uh, Morgan Wood fonts. We did a series of ads and a lot of materials where we connected all the things of the public where they really had one sort of normal unified identity. 
And we did this fairly faithfully for about two and a half years until I realized it worked. It looked good in advertising, but it was incredibly boring in repetition. And I, I found it very difficult to extend it. Um, you recognize the identity before you recognize the imagery. I li rather like two of the, the summer posters, but I felt that all in all, it didn't have the same, what I would call legs as the first identity. And so I began to disrupt it. Still, I continually felt that the theater wasn't getting the recognition it needed. These things worked well in the newspaper and they worked well as small space ads, but they weren't powerful enough or memorable enough unless a play was a big hit. And then you remembered the play and you didn't remember the public. In 2008, uh, we also, when I was on the board, we also began working on the redesign of the pu public's lobby, uh, lobby in front of the building. And at this point in time, I began to realize that I couldn't be on the board and do the uh, identity in the uh, lobby because it would be a conflict of interest because the city gave the public money and I couldn't theoretically do the design if I was a board member. So I resigned the board because I didn't want to walk into the public theater and not have done the lobby and uh, began working with Jim Polshek on this lobby renovation. Um, the lobby renovation, which still exists pretty much intact from the way we did it in 2010, uh, used uh, a lot of interesting devices. We incised the typography into the wall. We hired Ben Rubin to make this um, a uh, chandelier that plays all of Shakespeare's plays. And uh, we, um, here it is in motion. They're hard to read, but they're all 39 plays around on these blades. The, uh, here's the information desk. And the, permanent, the permanence of this place gave me sort of newfound confidence and interest in really revisiting the way I was working on the public. And I realized that the amalgamation of the things I had made were, were stronger than they were individually. And that these posters that I had made to represent the public were really at this point kind of antiques in that they belong behind glass someplace, but they didn't really live out on the street. And most of the things that were produced uh, contemporarily had become digital. We did a campaign for the new season that was both digital and in print. And this one, in this one, it was handled really like a big advertising campaign because it opened uh, up the public theater's new lobby. And we bought the last of the phone kiosks. We put it in the subways. We put it in subway cars. And it had its impact, but it wasn't the way I wanted to publicize the public. I wanted it to become a situation where the kind of graphic that existed on a poster could be seen in a broad, more broader and, and greater capacity, like the way the summer festivals work. So I began designing posters where the other components of the public theater were designed within the same style. So that these are signs for the, for the Delacorte Theater and it also is the same color system and, and design we use for, for Joe's Pub. Then I began to extend it to everything. And so we would design a season. The season would have its look. It would have its signage. It would have all the components necessary and it could be put into a manual based on the components and it could become every single thing the public made. The second season we did this, we did a skewed typography. Every one of these things has their, their own device to them. And uh, the people at the public theater actually refer to the seasons in relationship to the graphics. So they'll say, was that in the zigzag season or in the backwards season? And they, they've come to define it and it's become their own uh, personal language. If you'll notice, by the way, Right in the middle of this uh, poster is a, a title for a show that opened to the public that year that happened to be called Hamilton. 
And you would never know it would be an international hit from the fact that it existed within all of these things. But when it went to Broadway, it was, well, the public maintained a royalty and took credit for it. It belonged to the theater that it was produced in, even though it opened to the public. But a funny thing began to happen. And what happened with these things is that membership started to increase because people perceived all of the things that the public theater did collectively, not as individual posters that they recognized and never heard of the play after, so that you would buy into a season. If three of the plays were good, in many ways, that's all they needed. This is a sketch for what came to be known as the slashy season. And here we really got everything the public made into the system. I began to realize that I had not even begun to understand what identity does as I designed the public theater. Um, I realized that it's impossible to know what's going to happen with technology over a period of 25 years, that it is impossible to know how audiences are going to understand things over 25 years. And as I began changing these things, I realized that what the public theater had become is my R&D. It is my research and development, that because it is this living, growing thing that changes season to season, I can experiment with what works and what doesn't and then figure out how to reinvent it for another season. This, this one, which was uh, the year that, I think this was 2016 and they made Julius Caesar in the park. Uh, Julius Caesar looked like Donald Trump and there was a lot of criticism and Delta Airlines went away and they lost their funding and then uh, JetBlue came back in and refunded them. And this thing made a controversy all over New York. And I realized that the identity had finally worked in that when the Daily News put this, the story on the cover of their newspaper, they used a public theater image, not a picture of a, of a celebrity or the person in the play or even the logo. It was the, it was the public theater identity from the poster. And it had made made consciousness in New York City. This was two years ago. We began animating them because we could get kiosk space, which was new. And we keep looking for other ways to be able to position this thing in New York City. Um, it's very expensive, but we managed to do it. However, what's happening now is that the whole New York public helps us out because these things aren't designed for just the street. They're really designed for people's Instagrams. And so when you make them, people connect to them and they promote the theater for you. And what I found is that the engagement of the public is greater than it, it's ever been and I feel bereft that we haven't launched this season yet, which will launch in September, largely because of COVID. And that not having the public be able to connect to it is sort of depressing. This is the way people really see these things and they, they publicize themselves. For me, this was such an incredible experience and such a learning process that I wrote it down and Here's the book, and it's out with Princeton University Press and or Princeton Architectural Press, and it's available online. And if a bookstore opens, it will be in one, too. It was supposed to come out in April. We delayed it. Um, it has five posters that you can open up and hang up in the back. Thank you very much, and a pleasure to be here. <laughs>